Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. We have a special guest today. Uh, it's our first interview of a non-prep school coach. Um, and his name is Brandon Goble, and he is the founder of Juco Advocate. So today we're going to dive in a little bit different than prep school, but we're going to try to educate everybody on the world of junior college basketball. And there's no one more informed on that than Brandon. So Brandon, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, appreciate you having me on, my friend. So we go back a couple of years now, now that we're both in Colorado. And um, I know we both have some Air Force Academy connections. But tell me how, how you got in the basketball world and kind of what's your, what's your basketball history to get you to this point? Yeah, kind of a weird um, journey thus far, <clears throat> I guess. So uh, I was a, a college water polo player, was not a, a college basketball player. And so really kind of <clears throat> fell in love with the analytics side of things um, later on after I was done with school. And so kind of got into that world and and was working with a division one staff on analytics stuff kind of when it was becoming cool. Um, and so got into you know, that, that realm of it. And through that process, met a kid named Solomon Heine that um, was a, a military veteran, Air Force veteran that had um, been in the, the service for six years and was getting out and wanted to play division one basketball, but didn't have any idea, you know, what to do or anything like that. And so I said, well, I, you know, I know one coach <laughs> at this point outside of the staff that I'm working with. So um, he's at a junior college down in uh, Midland, Texas. And and I said, I'll work you out and film you. And, um, and by work you out, I mean, I'll have somebody else come work you out and, uh, and, but I'll film you and, and, you know, see what I think and, and, you know, send it down there. And he ended up going to junior college and, and then three years of division one basketball. And, uh, and so through that process of, you know, once we kind of got him to junior college, uh, you know, fell in love with, with the junior college process and fell in love with the junior college stories. Um, and it was great for me to be able to kind of tell that first story because uh, everybody always says, well, what do you do now? And, you know, we have our hands in so many different things and uh, projects and, and businesses and stuff that we do all over the world. And I, and I just kind of tell people like, I tell stories for a living now. And, and you know, we, we go around and we find them and uh, we help kids tell their own story. And so that's, that's kind of what we do now. And, and I was fortunate that that very first one was so unique and different and, you know, compelling and, and really kind of drove me towards falling in love with this process. And after you helped Solomon though, like, tell me how the next step happened. Did you find another player? Did you talk to another Juco coach or how did it, it was yeah. chaos? It, uh, so through his recruitment, I basically on my, my personal Twitter account, um, I started sending out his stuff to, to every division one coach on Twitter. And I would look because I didn't have hardly anybody following my, my personal account. Um, I knew if there was an interaction with the tweet that it was probably the coach that was, was viewing it. And so I would watch. And then all of a sudden there'd be an engagement, like a link click to the film that I had sent them. And then I would follow up with another one and another one. And then sure enough, they'd hit my, my messages and say, you know, tell me more about this kid and who the heck are you? And so I actually started building some relationships with division one coaches and things through that. And uh, some guys said, you know, Hey, you should probably like, see, you know, there's some other kids that, that you can help. And here's some junior college coaches. So they started sending me phone numbers and everything. And sure enough, pretty soon uh, my, my, Twitter started kind of blowing up with, with kids hitting me up. And so I created this spreadsheet and I was like, okay, well, you know, I got 15 kids on this thing. And then 15 turned into 30, turned into 60. And finally I had 300 kids on this spreadsheet that I'm tweeting stuff out about or whatever. And, and I said, you know, there's, I should probably formalize this in some way and, and start a Juco advocate with the help of a couple of people I had met through the process. And, uh, and it just kind of blew up and here we are four years later. Gotcha. Oh, four years. That's all you've been doing it. Yep. And it's blown yep. up this quick. Yep. So tell me if I'm a kid reaching out to Juco Advocate on Twitter, like what are some things that will make you take on that kid and want to show them off the Juco junior college coaches? And what are some things that you see where that's just not going to be a good fit? Yeah, it's, um, it's hard because kids, I know, I, I guess at this point that the competition level is, 
crazy, you know, for any sort of position at any level, right? It doesn't matter, you know, we're talking high major division one or division two NAIA, like it's, it's chaos, right? And so really making yourself stand out is, is a key to it. And, you know, my, I get 150, 200 messages a day on Mm. just on Twitter, right? Let alone all the other things that are going on. And so, um, unfortunately, like I can't help everybody. And, and one of the things that, that can really kind of help people stand out is just how they interact with you via that message. Um, having all their stuff together, that first crack, like I don't have time to ask a thousand questions, you know, and pull things out of you. I used to, I, I, I just don't anymore. And so, you know, I, I'm constantly looking at messages and passing information along quickly um, where, you know, I, I, I can't spend days, uh, you know, in most cases, um, trying to find schools, trying to find opportunities and things like that. So what I, I guess I probably do the most these days, uh, on, except for choices that I make where I'm reaching out to certain players and moving, you know, things and and all that is I will, I will give you, um, the exposure of our network, which is, is pretty vast. Uh, but in a, in a relatively short period of time. So you need to have everything together. You know, you need to have your film. You need to have your contact information. I shouldn't be asking about your grades. Like if you reach out, like I need to know what they are because it, it really matters for, uh, you know, what you could qualify for level wise, what you could qualify for scholarship wise. Uh, junior college is a space where your academics do matter. People think like, oh, junior college is just for, you know, dumb kids. Like that's, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and so, it's if you're a high academic kid, maybe you can't get a full scholarship on the athletic side of it because not all junior colleges are fully funded with full academic scholarships across the entire roster. But some guys are able to piece together academic and athletic money. And if you're a good student, you can get money from that, um, especially at the Division II level, which there are tons of, of really good Division II junior colleges that send players on to four year levels. A lot of those don't have full scholarships. And so if you're academic, you can get, you can basically get the whole thing paid for. Um, so I need to know that stuff though. Right. As opposed to like, hi, my name is so-and-so and and I'm six foot two and you know, I'm good at basketball. Like I get those messages all the time and I'm like, what do you want me to do with that? I'm a hard worker. (laughs) Yeah. I'm just, I'm a guy, you know, I just need an opportunity and it's like, okay, I understand like everybody needs an opportunity, but I also have to have something to work with. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, the most information you can kind of pack into something that that allows me to take a couple minutes to watch your film and at least decide whether or not it's something, you know, to, to dig further into or to, to send to somebody I know or even just put it out on our social media stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're fortunate that we've gotten to the point where if we put somebody's stuff out there uh, and, and they're they're good enough, like they're usually going to get contacted by somebody. And so. Yeah, because you've vouched for them if you've put them up. They've right. got through all those firewalls to get to that point. Yep. yep. So that's a great lesson there. And that, I think every level of coach will get those emails where it's just a kid saying, sup, you know, want to play yes. in all lowercase letters. And, you know, you can, you can find my uh, highlights on Google. So players, if you're listening, we say this all the time. You have to make it as easy as possible for coaches. You have to have everything in there, you know, your transcript highlights game tape contact information social media uh, why you want to do this potentially your financial situation too because coaches don't have time there's so only so much bandwidth they have and if you're a guard this is even more important now if you're six eight or taller you're even a lot more benefit of the doubt (laughs) yeah you can keep it all lowercase and not have the best transcript and there will be a spot for you somewhere but for guards i mean I, i think i've had probably 300 kids reach out this year brandon i've had two guys above the side, height of six, seven, yeah. right? So what's going to separate the rest of those guys, yeah. right? And it's probably the same for junior college as well. Yeah. And, and honestly, I mean, the sad part of it is, is because we're so busy and we have so much going on, we have so many kids we're trying to help that if I get a message that says what's good, I'm not clicking on it. Yeah. Like I, I just, like the, the instant, it, and that's not, it's not even that that is, truly reflective of who you are or what you meant to do or what you meant to say, but there's no room for error. You know, we're talking about a very finite number of 
places for a, a kid to play basketball beyond high school in comparison to the population of, of the students. And so, yeah, it becomes a, it becomes a separate yourself thing. There are kids that I've helped get scholarships that I know are not as good as maybe some of the what's up guys, but it just, I, yeah. I have to pick and choose. And, and I, if I am trying to vouch for somebody with, with a coach uh, you know, if I build any sort of relationship with a kid, uh, a lot of times it's not necessarily just the talent level that, that we're looking at, because I want to know when you go to that school um, and I've made this mistake before, so I've learned my lesson. I need to know that if you go to that school and things go sideways, you know, you're going to have a bad practice. You're going to have a bad week. You're going to fail a test. You're going to whatever that you have what it takes to work through that that you have what it takes when your coach is burning you into the ground during a practice one day or something that you're going to respond positively or something like, I don't want the message back from the coach that says, Hey, remember that kid that you connected me with? Well, like he's already gone, you know, and in a super oversimplified, stupid way, starting off a message to somebody with what's up. I, I, I can't, I, I just can't. You know, because if if you think that the way to speak to somebody that can help you is to to talk like that right away, I got no idea what you're going to say to the coach when you show up the first the first time. It just it is what it is. Like it's such a razor thin edge of of ah. <laughs> you know what I use, Brandon? I use the clone analogy. So say you've got two exact players, exact same grades, exact same skill set, but one writes a long nice email and one writes says what's up. Which one's the coach going to take? right the long email every time just like clone players everything's the same but this guy takes charge this guy doesn't the right which is taking the guy that takes i mean charge, we always so. talk about like the nba this is this is a perfect analogy for it in the nba the difference between the 13th guy on the bench in the nba and 2000 other players that that aren't in the nba is nothing there's no difference i mean there's they, they, they're all a bunch of clones at that point you know even at that elite elite level and the thing that gets that 13th guy that roster spot a lot of times is do your job you know don't create problems be be a good person you know be a good community member but 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 and it's the same thing here where like the difference between uh you know the the guy that that gets the scholarship you know at the mid-level school and whatever and a thousand other kids is razor thin if any difference at all and so it's going to be all the other things that that get you that spot yeah. that you know coaches are able to say you know what well here I, I always tell guys like make sure your floor is as high as possible because when it comes down to it if there's 10 players a coach is looking at and for that last spot he's going to take the guy whose floor is the highest and part of what goes into making that floor the highest is going to be things like character and communication and understanding and ability to learn and ability to um you know, just be that teammate and stuff. And because all those 10 guys are all going to be able to make shots are all going to be, you're not getting a look if you're not a good basketball player. So how high is your floor means a lot more for that last spot than how high is your ceiling. Right. You said earlier, you really liked junior college basketball. What, what do you like about it? You know, it's um, it's an interesting thing because everybody that is probably listening to this thinks that, you know, all right, I'm going to go to uh, a four year, school, NCAA school. I'm going to play division one basketball. I'm going to, you know, maybe I'm going to get a shot at the NBA. I mean, not everybody thinks that I hope, but a lot uh, to. there's a going lot to be to. a lot to do. Right. <laughs> and I know no better way to test that theory than by playing junior college basketball. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the fact that you're going to see a lot of things in junior college basketball, you're going to come across a lot of situations that are going to test you. You're going to be put in places that you're so incredibly uncomfortable uh, from, from your, you know, wherever you were before that if you make it through that, you're probably going to be all right at the next spot. You know, it's junior college will test you a lot. And Give me an example of that. So, well, Solomon, right? So this is this, this Solomon, Solomon was perfect because I got to experience everything good and bad through the process with Solomon. Cause obviously I'm on the phone with him every night. Mm. So you have a guy that was in the military 
right? He was uh, uh, honorably discharged when he decided to get out and pursue basketball. He's, he's incredibly intelligent, organized, all these sorts of things. Junior college basketball was not what Solomon was built for, right? I mean, he had done some time at the prep school at the Air Force Academy. Um, you know, he, he knew his stuff. And so he got down there and I swear it was probably the first night when he called me, he's like, what have you done? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm new to this as well. Um, and so he, uh, he shows up and, you know, Midland, Texas, it's out in the middle of nowhere, right? It's actually a pretty solid town in comparison to a lot of junior college towns, but I mean, it's middle of nowhere, right? West Texas. And um, it's out near Odessa. And, and so, you know, you've got that whole thing where he's just, fish out of water, you know, for a dude that had been deployed to Afghanistan, he's uncomfortable in Midland, Texas. Okay. Um, it, it's the, the team is chock full of division one players, right? It's it, high level basketball, you know, where he went. So, and I didn't even have an understanding at the time that like, I just threw this guy to the wolves. Mm -hmm. He hasn't played organized basketball in six years. And he's going to a team that has eight division one players on it. I think from his, his one year at Midland, seven of the guys ended up playing professional basketball at some level. Um, so, so that was, that was not necessarily fair to him, but uh, you know, you, you have this, this wide diverse group of kids that are coming from all over the planet, literally. I mean, there's international kids, there's kids from Chicago, there's kids from Florida, there's kids from Texas, they're, they're everywhere and all coming together and everybody has a different story. And the thing about junior college is that if you go from high school to let's say an Ivy league school or, or let's go to a NEPSAC school, right? You've, you probably have some level of understanding of kind of where everybody's story kind of fits together. Um, you know, because the NEPSAC is very selective about, you know, admissions and, you know, the, the background and, you know, different things like that, like Midland and a lot of junior colleges, like, are you a Hooper? Yeah, cool. All right, let's go. And the rest of the stuff is kind of secondary to that. So, uh, a guy like Solomon comes in and, you know, there's, there's disorganization and there's strong alpha. I mean, you've got 13 alpha dogs <laughs> on a team. Like that's, that's hard to manage. And, and that's hard for Solomon because in the military, there are not 13 alpha dogs, right? You know, when you're in your group, it's alpha dog and everybody shuts up and listens to alpha dog. Um, that's not the case in junior college. And so, uh, if you can get through all of those ups and downs and things like that, uh, relatively unscathed, um, I know that at that next four-year level, I mean, I, I talk to junior college guys all the time and they say, well, this is easy. Like, this is nothing compared to what, what I did. You know, we've got this hashtag thing we do, hashtag Juco product, right? And it's a pride thing for these guys. You know, it's like running, I ran the gauntlet. You know, everybody wears around a t-shirt that says, you know, hashtag Juco product, because like I've been, I've seen some stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I came out and, and here I am. And if you take advantage of, of the opportunity, like Solomon did, where he's calling me every night, he's like, I want, I want to leave. I, or I'm going to kill somebody <laughs> like this is, this is crazy. And we would talk through it and, you know, he would, he would, whatever. Um, it worked out. I mean, Solomon played you know, he got an undergrad degree, uh, from, uh, from a four-year school. Then he, uh, grad transferred and got a master's, uh, while playing division one basketball, set a school record for wins and, uh, played a little bit of pro ball. And, you know, his, his journey is, is still ongoing. And I can guarantee you that, that there's none of that journey that he would give up, um, you know, for, for where it has gotten him now. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that he spent a year in the most uncomfortable situation he mm. had ever been in. And that's coming from a guy with combat deployment experience. So, but if I'm a college coach and I see Solomon's background, one, he get smart enough to get in the air force Academy and go to their prep school yep. Two, seen wartime action. Three went to a Juco like Midland, like that guy's not going to be phased when the going gets tough in a game. So I, he, I can imagine like he has some great options coming out of Juco. It was funny. Coaches would call and they would say, well, how's he handle pressure? <laughs> and I, I remember somebody at Wichita state, I think. And, uh, and I said, well, are they, are they shooting at him <laughs> yeah. in the game? No. All right. He's going to be okay. You know, South Dakota said, well, would he want to come to Vermilion, South Dakota? 
was like he literally like a year ago was sleeping in a tent in Afghanistan. I think he's going to be okay, you know, relax. And and honestly, like that translates to a lot of the junior college kids that um, when I talk to coaches and they say, you know, handling the pressure, handling the intensity, whatever. And I'm like, yo, you ever seen South Plains in Odessa go at it? Like, you know, that's a basketball game. Um, and so there's a lot of those, those things that the toughness and the, the intensity and the pressure and all that of junior college is something that's not on the national radar. Um, but people that know, know that this is, this is really preparing somebody for the next level. Help me on this. And, and I need help on this stuff as well as a lot of listeners to this. My conception of JUCO was, um, the stereotype is you're only going there. One, if you've gotten in trouble or two, if you did not qualify. Right. And it sounds like I'm off on that. So tell me, can you still do that? If you get in trouble, can you still go to JUCO? And if you haven't qualified, sure. is that still the route to take if you want to go D1? Or are there other kids that graduate high school with a 3.8 and just want to do it for D1? Kind of tell me the range of kids that would, would go this route. I, I would say, um, you know, junior college has changed. Uh, in the 90s, it was probably more towards, you know, what you imagined it was. I mean, obviously there was individual cases and things like that, but it kind of had a reputation for a reason of, you know, didn't qualify in trouble, you know, whatever. And it has changed to where that still exists for sure. But more and more kids are taking advantage of it from the standpoint of just being under recruited. Uh, the, the interesting thing is, is now in 2021, it is easier to get seen than it has ever been, right? Because we have YouTube and we have the internet and we have, you know, you can, you can film, you can make highlights on your phone, right? Um, you didn't used to have that. So it's easier to get seen than it has ever been. However, that means everybody can get seen. And so, you know, there might've been a time where the kid from, you know, some rural town doesn't get seen and never winds up with whatever. And so maybe he, he goes to junior college. Well, now even the kid in a major city is getting overlooked because the kid in the rural town is able to get seen, you know, and he wasn't before. So uh, there's definitely a, a large number of kids that are going to junior college just for the fact that, that they either hadn't developed physically enough yet, hadn't developed their game enough yet. Uh, they're, under recruited for a number of reasons. There's still the guys that don't qualify for sure. Um, you know, and, and I would say a, a good number, you know, of, of guys that don't qualify, uh, which is also changing now with the NCAA not requiring the, the test score as of right now. Um, so that will change some of the qualifying status for guys. Uh, international is, is, a, is a big piece. And that's a space that I do a lot of work in where international kids going to junior college. Um, and then, uh, you know, you've also got, you've also got high academic kids all over the place too. Uh, I always love telling the story of Alahan Demir. Uh, that was a kid that went to central Wyoming. He had a 32 ACT and a 40 GPA. And so he went to, uh, went to junior college and, um, for a year and, and was, was good. Um, but, was, you know, kind of out in the middle of nowhere in central Wyoming. And, and he was kind of one of those Euro, you know, you're not sure what he does great sort of guys, but like incredibly intelligent, worked hard. Like, honestly, he's the modern big man because he could really pass it. He could shoot it, you know, all that kind of stuff, but he wasn't jumping out of the gym. Right. And, and so he didn't necessarily stand out around a bunch of pogo sticks around him. Um, and so he ended up going to Drexel and averaged like 16 and eight at, at Drexel and then grad transferred to Minnesota because he was so intelligent that he graduated from Drexel in three years. And, and, you know, was a starting foreman at, at Minnesota and now plays pro over in Turkey. And people hear that story and they're like, well, why was he at junior college? You know, he's all this sort of thing. Well, he was just under recruited. Like people weren't paying attention to him. So he took advantage of it and went there and, and was still kind of under recruited, but, you know, got that division one look and took full advantage. So right. uh, Alahan is, is not the poster child of, junior college in a lot of people's minds, but there's a lot of Alahans out there. So. So if you're a co if I'm a college coach, you're, you're obviously recruiting first, depending on what school you're at and what, what your requirements are to get admission wise, but like you've got high school prep school, international JUCO, right? I obviously give my pitch for prep school all the time on why it's a better advantage to come out of a prep school versus a high school. But you know, 
give me your opinion. If I'm a college coach, and I know you're, you're not, but you talk to plenty of them. And I see, and we talked about a kid a couple months ago who was at a prep school who transferred to a JUCO. So we actually had this conversation, but share with people when it makes sense to go to a junior college and use up a year of eligibility. I'm, that's not, that's not worry about COVID right now, but right. why should I go to JUCO instead of a prep school? What's the ideal situation for that? And what would your pitch be to that? And second question to that will be, what do college coaches see? Would college coaches rather have a JUCO player stereotypically or a prep school player or international or high school? How would you rank those? So obviously you and I both know on the prep school side of things, not all things are created equal. Correct. Right. Um, so anybody listening uh, out here needs to, to listen to Corey when he says, this is a real prep school. This is a real situation. This is a situation that kids get recruited from because you're going to hear it from a thousand other schools that none of that is true. Right. So prep school, all things definitely not being created equal. And it's the same way in junior college as well. There are junior colleges that, you know, coach doesn't help with recruiting, you know, the film, whatever. So you got to do your homework either way. But um, it makes sense to go to a junior college instead of a prep school when you have maximized the benefit that you could get out of that situation. Understanding that if you go to junior college, let's, let's, let's just say you're a division one level player, right? Or, or you have the potential to be a division one level player. If you go to the right junior college, um, you're going to play with and against division one players every night. Like it's, it's not like you're the division one player on your team. And then there's everybody else in, in junior college. There's about four, 350 to 400 kids that go division one alone from junior college every year. And that's a lot like that's, that's a significantly high number. Um, and the reason being is because they have college experience, right. And they're playing with and against division one guys every single night. And so if you've maximized what you're going to be able to get coaching wise, what you're going to be able to get physically, what you're going to be able to get in all those exposure, things like that at the high school, like if that prep school is not going to add a massive amount, you know, and all you're just going to be is a year older and you're, and you're physically ready and your game is ready and things like that, go test it against junior college because a junior college kid with three years to play. So if, even if you're a qualifier, right. A junior college kid with three years to play has, and, and is good has always been gold mm. to these four-year schools because they know that you are physically ready. You are mentally ready. Your, your game is showing against high level competition. Like they don't have to sit there and say, well, it's tough to tell how good he's going to be here because he's beating the crap out of a bunch of guys that are, you know, division three players. Or, and it, well, that's not even fair because division three basketball is really good. Uh, guys that maybe aren't even going to play college basketball, you know? Um, so it's it, it, that junior college kid with three years to play has always, has always been gold. And, you know, I know we're talking about once, once COVID is over and things like that, but anybody that's considering things right now do understand that because of the limited number of scholarships at the four-year level now as well, next year is going to be even crazier uh, because those scholarship limits are going to have to come down at the four-year level. Um, you know, junior college is an opportunity to, to, to really kind of separate yourself um, you know, even if it's after a year of, of post-grad or, or prep school or, you know, things like that, they, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. So, yeah, a couple of things, there are prep school or post-grad kids that end up do going to JUCO. For sure. Happens, Tons of right? them. Happens. Yep. And also there are plenty of prep schools that have three to more D1 players in the team. Some even have yep. 10 to 12 and there's plenty that don't. Right. Yep. So, um, and they're, they're a little bit different animals too. So it's kind of a case by case basis for the family, but I'm trying to think how to, how to frame this here. So if I'm a college coach, so let me think here. <laughs> I should be a little bit more organized in this, but you're, 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 you're stirring a lot of questions in my brain. I'm trying to think like, all right, let me ask you this. This is the question I always put out there to families. You've got to ask the right questions to prep school coaches yep. and make sure they can answer them with confidence. And as we all know, coaches are great salesmen, right? So even though you might ask one question, it might not be the truth. Right. What are some main questions? If I'm a parent or a kid, I don't have JUCO advocate, but I want to look into the prep school world. What are some things I should look for? Say I'm an average, you know, 6'5", 
decent grades. I'm a qualifier. I'm in the middle of nowhere, but just want to do the JUCO route. There, there's JUCOs all across the country. So where would I start my search and what questions should I be asking? Well, I think, I think with any decision, whether it's prep school, post-grad, junior college, you, you got to talk to people that know what they're talking about before you even get to figuring out the schools, right? Parents need to be talking to you. Kids need to be talking to you. Parents and kids contact me all the time. Even if I'm not necessarily helping them with their recruitment per se, I'm always happy to answer questions about, you know, kind of whatever. Um, there's, there's a, you know, there, there is a, a problem, I guess, um, and it's in all walks of life, really, with uh, feel for who you are, what you are, what your potential is, all that sort of thing. You know, I get parents that'll hit me up and they say, hey, can you uh, reach out to Indian Hills, you know, for me uh, about my son? Well, Indian Hills is one of, if not the top program in, in junior college. And they see that, you know, he sends 10 to 13 guys division one every year. And, and then I look at the film and I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> you know, no, you, you, this is just not uh, whatever. So there, there definitely needs to be a feel for where you fit in and trust people like you trust people like me. It's, it's not that we're saying that you can't be good or you're not good or whatever, but not everybody is a high major player, right? Not everybody can play at Indian Hills. Not everybody can play at the top, you know, post-grads and, and prep schools and things. So feel first. Then once you kind of figure out where you fit into the world um, and you start talking to schools and you start being recruited, ask for receipts. Like, all right, cool coach. You're saying that my son is going to be X, Y, and Z and that you're going to be able to do X, Y, and Z. Give me receipts. You know, who, who have you, who has been at your program in the past? Where have they gone? Um, you know, all that sort of thing. I got guys that I take, I, I say, Hey, reach out to, you know, this kid on, on Twitter and ask them what their experience was like, you know, playing for this coach, ask them what their experience was like through the recruitment. You know, what is that relationship like to this day? Right. Uh, a guy like Hank Polona at Indian Hills, he talks to Nooney Omot probably once a week. Nooney hasn't been a, on one of Hank's teams in years. You know, Nooney played at Baylor and now is a pro and Hank still talks to him like once a week. And, you know, those kinds of things are important because, um, you know, unfortunately, in the world of basketball, uh, a lot of these kids are just assets, right? They're just assets to whatever that coach's own motivations are. And if you can really like get the receipts and decide for yourself what's important to you, is a relationship the most important thing to you? Cool. Right. Find out, you know, what is this guy's relationship like with players? Is it just going on to a division one or a four year level? That's fine. You know, if you want to just show up and do your work and not worry about the relationship and stuff, that's okay. But then say, okay, coach, like last five years, how many kids have gone on to whatever it is that I'm interested in doing? Because, um, you know, unfortunately, I, I do see a lot where kids say, well, you know, this coach said that he would do X, Y, and Z for me. And I'm, you know, I, I'll, I'm a division one player, according to him. And, and, you know, he's going to get me division one. And I say, man, that guy hasn't sent a kid division one in five years, you know, like, I don't know what to tell you, but that I, you, you're probably not going to be the, you know, the one that changes all of that for him um, kind of thing. And, you know, unfortunately it doesn't always have to do with talent. You know, there are plenty of guys that just don't get on to whatever they want to get onto because the coach doesn't answer phone calls. He doesn't um, you know, doesn't help develop, doesn't uh, make sure that your academics are in order. That's another thing guys have to remember. If you're a qualifier, for example, going to a junior college and you're just going to go for a year and then move on to a four-year school, you have certain classes you have to take as a freshman. You have to take uh, science with a lab and uh, college algebra and comp one. Like you have to do all that in the first year, which is fine. It's not that hard. But if you get to the end and you didn't do that, you're not going anywhere. So... Can you tell me the difference? Why would someone be at a JUCO for one year versus two? What's the situation on that? Um, everybody's a little bit different. So if you're a qualifier, uh, you only have you, you don't have to go for two. Uh, you would only have to go for one. Some guys will stay for a second year um, because of development. You know, like we we got a kid that we know right now that's um, uh, at a school. Uh, in region nine that, you know, kind of went into the freshman year and we thought, uh, you know, he's, he's maybe going to develop enough to be a division one guy, I think after this season, and he's, he's probably not quite there yet. So he'll go back for another year and continue to get better and continue, can you 
continue to develop. And, uh, and, you know, he'll, he'll be recruited at a, at a pretty high level after that. I mean, it, the funny thing is, is we see kids in high school. I have such a hard time watching high school basketball a lot of times now because I'm watching junior college and I'm watching these grown men play basketball. And, and then I go back and watch the high school game. And it's crazy how much a kid develops between his senior year of high school and the end of his freshman year to junior college. And the growth continues at that rate from your freshman year of junior college to your sophomore year of junior college. So a lot of guys just need that second year. If you're not a qualifier, you have to graduate from junior college okay. to, to get NCAA eligibility. Uh, you have to get your, your AA degree. And there are certain core requirements, just like out of high school. There are certain core class requirements and GPA requirements in junior college that you have to hit to get division one eligibility. And gotcha. same thing with division two as well. Okay. Um, in the prep school world, one of the things prep school coaches have to do, I'm talking brick and mortar prep schools. Okay. Not the academies. <laughs> Uh, they have to place their their kids, right? All their postgrads or seniors that are in their last year. That's one reason kids go to prep school is they will get placed at the next level. You can't not do it. Yep. If you don't place your kids, it's a failure. Um, and, and these coaches have great track records, records of doing that. With junior college, are they required to just do their integrity to place every kid on their team that's either going to leave after their first year, second year? And if so, like – is that difficult since they have such big rosters and there's only a few spots or are they really going out to really small uh, auxiliary schools and like the sticks? Um, How does that work with placement? It's a mix. So there are some coaches that just don't care and they move on. Um, you know, they maybe don't even take phone calls and things. So that's where, that's where I say, you know, get receipts before you, um, you know, commit to somebody or, or believe all of what they're saying, right? There are some guys um, that will work their full flipping head off to get that entire roster somewhere. Okay. Um, because if you're, if you're capable of playing at the junior college level, there's a chance, there's a good chance that you're capable of playing at some level of four-year school, you know, whether it be all the way down to USCAA, you know, level stuff, uh, which a lot of guys probably haven't even heard of that, but it's another distinction like NCAA and AIA. It's a, a, a league of schools, um, you know, or, or on all the way up to, to high major. Um, and there may be, there may be that wide of a breadth uh, uh, on one team. There may be a high major guy on a team. And then the, you know, in junior college, you get 15 spots. The 15th guy on that roster might be a USCAA caliber player. And some coaches will work and work and work and work to get those guys uh, places. And, you know, it's, it's really just goes from one to the other. I mean, honestly, that one of the things that keeps a program like Indian Hills churning along is Hank is able to say, look at where all my guys go. Sure. You know, look at where we, we send them, look at the success level they have, look at, you know, all these sorts of things. And so when it comes to a recruiting battle, they're able to really show that. Um, because if you're good enough to be recruited by an Indian Hills, you're good enough to be recruited by a hundred other schools that want you as well. So Hank knows he has to say like, Hey, look at what, look at what we're able to do other places. I mean, there's just, you know, out of the way schools, out of the way kids, they just kind of build a roster from what's available and they just, you know, Mm. do their thing. And unfortunately that's where I got to come in a lot of times is if I see a player that's, um, you know, I think is really good. I, you know, it's funny. Sometimes I'll, I'll get no support from the staff or the, the school or whatever. And I'm doing everything myself and contacting the kid directly and putting his film together. And, you know, the coach, the recruiter says, well, you know, sh- who should I call his coach? I'm like, good luck. You know, I haven't been able to get all of them all year um, kind of thing. So everybody's different. It's the same thing in the prep school world. You know, there's, there's guys that just want your money um, and you're paying for somebody else's scholarship. Uh, and then there's, you know, the, the really good ones that, you know, bust their butts to get stuff done for you. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, money and tuition. So obviously there's scholarships out there. Explain the scholarship situation from like, you know, in Indian Hills all the way down to maybe a division two junior college. And then explain like, if you don't get a scholarship, like, do you get Pell Grants? Do you get academic aid? And what would be the full tuition if you had to pay it for a year at one of these places? Yeah. Um, Indian Hills is, is kind of the model of the highest level, right? Think of Indian Hills like Duke. And so, you know, at Indian Hills, you have all the resources, summer school, summer housing, full scholarship at every spot 
on that roster. All 15 spots are full scholarship, uh, food, uh, everything. You keep your Pell. So if you're a Pell grant qualifier, you get to keep that. You know, the school doesn't take it. Um, then once you kind of go down from that, every it gets super diverse. And every school is different, even if it's a Division One school. Not all Division One schools are 15 full scholarships. Um, so like uh, at McCook, uh, there are five fulls, I think, five or six full scholarships. And he'll split those sometimes, you know. And, and then if, if you're a Pell kid, um, you know, some of that money goes towards covering the rest of that cost, you know, whatever it is. And it's kind of, it's a pot of money that ends up being divvied up amongst the spots and depending on how you are as Pell and, and all that. The good part is, is that generally junior college is relatively inexpensive. So if you are a full Pell kid, um, there are some situations where if you're a full Pell kid, they'll take your Pell money, but you don't owe anything else. Like it only costs six or seven grand to go to school for the so What's the max a kid can get with a Pell grant? I think 6,800 is what it's at right now okay. for the year. And that depends on their financial situation of how mm-hmm. much they can get. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so, um, you know, everybody is really different. Uh, Des Moines area community college, Brett puts, does a phenomenal job there. Um, and actually you and I talked about that spot, uh, earlier this year. And so he doesn't have, um, a bunch of fulls he's got, you know, covers a, a large amount of it, but if a kid is academic, they can get them academic money. If a kid's a Pell kid, that'll cover stuff on the back end. But even if you're not a Pell kid and you don't have academic money and all that sort of thing, the cost is still pretty cheap, like you know, what? even with a partial scholarship. I mean, I think to go to McCook, which is, you know, division one, great facilities, all that sort of thing. I think their, their total cost for the year is like 8,000 bucks. For like yeah. everything. And I guess a kid could get a loan too if they needed it. Yeah. Or yeah Cause work, it's, do they work studies at junior colleges stuff. as well. They do work studies. Okay. They do, um, you know, just, just even outside of the work study, there's a lot of them that'll help guys get jobs. Um, you know, I was talking to a coach this morning and there's three kids that are going to go back for the summer to put in, you know, the extra, rather than go home, you know, they're going to take advantage of the facilities and, and be able to uh, live on campus and stuff. And they're going to just get them a job and they'll work this summer and you know all that sort of thing so everybody it's a it's a very diverse um system so extremely important when you're talking to coaches understand that not all opportunities are created equal you know this is great i'm learning this and i know we've talked about it before but like you know there's only certain qualified kids that can qualify for a lot of the brick and mortar prep schools and then you've got everyone else out there looking and that's where these pop-up academies will scoop these kids up you know, yep. they'll take five to 10 K they'll put them on a, in a group house. They'll have 40 kids in the program. Maybe that kid would benefit from spending that eight to 10 K at a junior college where yes. one less people two real school, three planning against men four. if he goes to the right one, these coaches can help place them. Yep. Maybe that's the angle I start taking now and actually sending them, you know, the, the kids I know they can play your way and seeing if there's any synergy there instead well, of them doing the post-grad year. Because you're going to always have kids that I'm just going to use Avon Farms, for example, just because I know the coach there. So you may have a kid that is good enough to, to play there, but because they've got a loaded roster or, you know, whatever, he's, he's just not going to get playing time. Right. And, and it's just not worth it for him to go there. And maybe it's the same thing at the other schools. I mean, these schools that you deal with are loaded, right? I mean, these are, these rosters are full. So, just because there isn't necessarily room for them to, to be an impact guy there and be worth their money doesn't mean they're not good basketball players or will, you know, won't become good basketball players. So there are junior college opportunities because there's so many more schools. There's so many more real good junior colleges than there are real good prep schools and postgrads um, that, you know, maybe that kid goes to Cleveland state community college with my guy, Raphael Howard over there. Um, this kid named Damian Forrest. Here, here's a good example for you. Out of high school, he was kind of a baby giraffe, hadn't grown into his body yet. He's like 6'10". He was from Denver. And uh, he ended up going to a D3 Michigan Dearborn uh, and was good. And so he says, well, I, you know, I think I'm a Division I caliber player. And so he's at Cleveland State Community College. And it's not on a full scholarship. He's using Pell money to, to pay the back end of the thing. He's going to end up with 15 or 20 Division I offers by the end of, of this season. Now, if that kid had gone to a postgrad or something like that, he maybe wasn't good enough yet at the time to, to be a high impact guy at one of these really good prep prep or postgrad schools. 
but at Cleveland community, Cleveland state community college, he's grown and developed and all that sort of thing. And, and had the opportunity to play. Uh, and now he's going to, you know, he's going to have all of these opportunities and things like that. So he was not good enough to go and be an impact guy, probably at one of the schools that you deal with, but he was good enough to make the roster uh, at, at Cleveland state and now has kind of blossomed into who he's going to be. Well, I will say if he's a 16 kid, one, he would have found a spot in a prep school <laughs> for and not paid much money. Yeah. Right? And yeah. he would have developed during that year and got placed. Now, would he have ended up D1? You know, he might have needed an extra year, which he's getting now right. to go D1, but he would have been seen by him or he would have got yeah, some. Yeah, I guess by being 6'10. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, we're talking baby giraffe now. When I know. he was in high school, you know, arms flailing. <laughs> but if he, if, like during COVID time, he would have had a hard time regardless. I mean, yeah, I've got a 6'11 yeah. kid now. Um, who, you know, hasn't hired me yet and ha- isn't wanting to go the prep school route yet because he's still waiting on those D1 offers, yeah, which aren't coming. They're yeah. not going to come. A college coach is going to take a yep. junior college kid or a prep school kid over a high school kid, especially yep. during COVID times. I know a kid in Denver right now that you've probably seen that's high academic that, uh, you know, is a high school kid that I think is at right now a low major division one player. I can't even get anybody to look at him. And why I know every you? coach in the country. But why would you? If you're a college coach, you have to win. Your, your job yeah. depends on this. So you're going to take a man from Juco. And that's, that's how I, I do it. I say Juco's first if a coach is going to recruit, if they can. Obviously, Stanford yeah. can't do Juco. Second, prep school slash international. International coaches will take a chance because it's mysterious. It could work <laughs> out. If it right. doesn't, well, whatever. And then the last yeah. on the list is high school seniors. Yeah. I mean, why would you take this kid that I'm talking about in Denver right now than Damien? Like Damien's averaging 15 and 10 in, in, you know, junior college right now. And he's got three years left to play. I'm probably taking Damien over the high school kid here in Denver who has four years left to play. I don't care the difference between, um, uh, you know, three and four years. Uh, so I'm going to take Damien because he's out there busting the butts of, of college kids as opposed. And that's not to say this other kid's not good. He's really good. But what's your, where's your floor? Let's talk Who's about him offline. Floor? Let's do that. You know? Yeah. Uh, let oh, me well. ask you. Let me ask you this. Um, so college coaches, they would, they don't care about the the extra year. Then they'll take a three year established JUCO guy versus a four year. Yeah. Everything no moves kid. so fast these okay. days. A coach's a coach's contract is probably not going to last to that fourth year if he's not winning. Interesting. You know? So those three years, I mean, you think about Le- Leonard Hamilton when he went to Florida State. He didn't win squat for the first six years that he was at Florida State. And then he started making the tournament all the time. And now, you know, Leonard Hamilton's one of the best coaches in the country. You think a guy can make it at Florida state these days for six years without winning? Heck no. (laughs) You know, you're not getting more than three or four and you better win. And so that fourth year don't matter. Right. Well, that's, that's a pitch I've used in the past for prep school kids is do a post-grade year. You don't lose that year of eligibility, but now for this conversation, that's, that's good for me to know. That's good for me to know. Okay. just means less than it used to. Talk to me about regions. So, you know, I know there's junior colleges in California. There's junior colleges in the Midwest. You've got them down in Florida, Texas. Um, Just talk to me about the differences between them. And if I'm a player from Kentucky, uh, should I look at a certain region or should player international players look at a certain region? Just, just walk us through that, that whole setup. So California is a little different. Um, There are no scholarships in California. Um, That's part of what they call the CCCAA. And that is its own junior college league. So you've got the NJCAA, which we call National JUCOs. And then you've got California, the the CCCAA. And then you have the NWAC, which is kind of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, you know, kind of area. Um, And so those are three leagues that don't play against each other. Right. And so then within those three regions, um, there are, you know, classifications uh well at the national level i guess uh it's d1 d2 d3 california and the nwac they're just different conferences okay so there's like a north and a south and whatever um so california does not have scholarships so it's not very expensive and if you're a california kid i believe you go for free Mm -hmm. um there's there's something there that that you can not have anything out of pocket uh but it's also not very expensive and there's some good basketball in there for sure um, you know, it, last chance you was coming out, um, I think this week and they did East LA, uh, community college. And I think, well, one of their kids this year is going to USC 
next year. So um, there's, uh, uh, you know, there's some high level basketball there. The NWAC, same thing. I mean, it's, you know, there, there's not as consistent of high level players as there is at the, the national level, but there's still good players in there. Um, they do have some scholarship stuff. And they are just now able to do scholarship things on some international players and players outside of the NWAC region. So kind of some rules and restrictions there. Uh, and then you've got the national junior college level, which is when people think of junior college, that's kind of the first thing they think of is the national one, because that's basically every state outside of, you know, the NWAC and the California. Um, regionally speaking, there are regions that are considered quote better you know, than others, uh, Florida and Texas are kind of, you know, the, the tops there, Iowa, uh, where Indian Hills is both their division one and division two programs are high level, um, kind of in Illinois, uh, the Jayhawk conference in Kansas, um, has historically been very good and, uh, you know, winning national championships and things like that. The national tournament every year is in Hutchinson, Kansas. Um, so every year I get to go to the sun and fun capital of the world and, Hutchinson, Kansas for the tournament, but there's, there's pockets as well. There are, you know, Harcum in Philadelphia is a great program. There's like nobody else really close to them. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like a high level, you know, program, maybe Allegheny, Maryland or something, but you know, it's just little, little pockets here and there. Uh, Monroe up in New York uh, is, is very good and, and has always uh, done well, but that region is not, you know, kind of considered one of the top regions. Uh, but Monroe will send three, four guys division one every year. Um, and so it's kind of just, it's spread all over the map, but you know, your, your strongest regions are going to be Texas, Florida, Iowa, Kansas, you know, and those championships every year, just, just chock full of college coaches. Oh my gosh. When we, when I go to Hutch, uh, so there's, there's a championship for each, um, level D1, D2, D3, but the, the one that, that everybody kind of refers to is, is just Hutch right, is in Hutchinson, Kansas, and it's Division I championship, uh, 24 teams um, playing over the span of a week uh, in a bracket-style uh, single elimination event, and the first four days where you'll see everybody play, I don't know, 600, 700 four-year coaches there, something like that, everybody from the highest of high major head coaches on down to you know, whatever. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a big party, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, uh, Hutch is, Hutch is basically a division one arena, uh, you know, the, the, the Hutchinson junior college team plays in. And so they have the national tournament there every year. Um, and, uh, it's interesting because there's, is this always the fight for hotels in a small town like that? Like, you know, who can, who can get a room? Like, yeah, now nah, I, I had to go to Wichita to, <laughs> to find a space. I waited too long to book my, book my hutch trip so and does, does like the champion of california or the nyack or the one in northwood do they send their champions to that or is it mm -hmm. just okay nope everybody's kind of separated that way um yeah and and then i, I kind of cannot think of the town that the division two one in is in uh, it's always in the same city as well uh but great basketball as well you know yeah. dmax the number one team in the country this year and uh you know they'll take a run at winning that thing and D-Max probably got six Division One guys on their team. They're Division Two junior college. Are junior college coaches, is their goal to get D1 or are a lot of them like happy where they're at? What's what's their motivation? Huge mix. Like okay. some guys are lifers, right? Steve Gearing's won, I don't know how many national championships at South Plains. Like he's not going anywhere. <laughs> uh, you know, Jay Herkelman at Coffeeville. Uh, Steve Eck at Hutch, uh, Todd Franklin at Vincennes, you know, a couple of those guys may see something, you know, they're, they're older now and, you know, they may say, Hey, you know, if I get an opportunity to maybe go straight to a division one head job, cause that happens too, you know, they're division one junior college head coaches that go straight into getting division one, you know, head jobs. Um, I mean, Steve Forbes, you know, was, was a division one assistant, was the head coach at Northwest Florida and then went on to East Tennessee state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's uh, the head coach Bethune Cookman uh, Ritter was at Daytona across the street. <laughs> he was at Daytona junior college. He literally didn't have to move. He carried his box of stuff out of the office across the street to Bethune Cookman and, uh, and is now the head coach there. So um, kind of a, kind of a wide breadth of, of what people's motivation are in junior college for sure. Gotcha. We've talked a lot today about JUCO and kind of a comparison to prep school. Is there anything we have not touched on that you think people should know about? 
uh, your world? Um, I, you know, honestly, I think it, one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is dispelling uh, rumor or, you know, people's preconceived notions of what something is. Um, now, a lot of times what their preconceived notion in is rooted in fact, you know, so if somebody says, well, you know, I heard, I heard uh, junior college is, is a bunch of non-qualifiers and, you know, they got bad kids on the team, whatever. Sure. I know junior college teams are a bunch of non-qualifiers and have a bunch of bad kids on them. I also know a bunch of division one schools that have a bunch of <laughs> bad kids on them and kids that can't, you know, hardly read or write as well. So, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Um, but if you do your homework and you ask the right questions and you talk to the right people, if there is a fit for you, you will find it. Mm. And, you know, really know yourself, know, you, you got to know how tough you are. You have to know how mentally tough you are. Um, you know, whether you're going to a post-grad a prep school, uh, you know, at the level that, that you deal with kids at uh, the four-year level, the junior college level, like you have to, you have to really know yourself to know what you're going to be able to handle. Know before you start looking that you say and reconcile with yourself, if I, if I mess up in practice and I just get destroyed and turned inside out and worn like a hat by the head coach, am I okay? You know, do I have what is needed within me? And I'm not saying you need to be, you know, some people like that's just not okay. And that's cool, but know yourself because there's enough information out there that people like you that know what you're doing, people like me that know what I'm doing that can tell you like, don't go there if you are not okay with whatever. Um, you know, maybe this is a better fit. It's, it's really, fit is so important and you just have to know yourself. And unfortunately, a lot of people forget to, you know, they, they spend so much time trying to get to know the school, the, the, the coach, the program, the, you know, where do they send their kids or whatever, they forget to check on themselves and really know themselves first. And that's the first thing you have to do is like, what am I, what am I physically mentally capable of doing and then find the right fit? Cause otherwise you're just, you know, throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Right. Oh, that's great advice. Well, Brandon, thanks so much for coming on today. This is so much information I learned. I think a lot of other people that maybe don't know as much about this uh, part of the basketball world learn some as, as, as well. Mind you, a lot of people know all about this world, right? They really do, and it's it's a big uh, it's a big provider of kids to to D one and D two programs across the country. So thank you so much. Thank you for all you're doing for the kids that reach out to you, that, that you're helping out, and uh, tell people where they can find you online. Yeah, we're uh, we're at JUCO Advocate on Twitter is kind of where I spend most of my day. Um, you know, we own Verbal Commits as well, and uh, so when you get that offer, it's it's going to be on Verbal Commits, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. You know, again, I get so many messages. I try to get to as many as possible, um, you know, and, and feel free to just keep messaging me as well. And I, you know, I'll, I'll see it eventually. Yeah. Well, sounds good. Well, folks, this was uh, Brandon Goebel, uh, the founder of Juco Advocate. We talked a lot of Juco today and uh, appreciate you tuning in and uh, have a great day.